Okay. Hi, I am Hannah Cohoon. I'm a member of the 2021 Collegeville Workshop on Scientific Software Organizing Team. And the meeting is held next week, July 20th through 22nd. You can join us virtually. And this year, the theme is software teams. And today I'm talking with Neil Chu Hong on that topic. And so we'll talk about your white paper in a minute. But first, can you help orient our viewers by describing your personal experience working with and studying software teams? Sure. Um, thanks very much, Hannah. Um, I'm director of something called the Software Sustainability Institute in the United Kingdom, and I'm also based in uh, the University of Edinburgh as a senior research fellow. And for much of the last uh, probably like 10, 15 years, I've been looking to see how different types of academic software project uh, do their development work, uh, manage their teams, and try to understand what are the characteristics of of successful projects, basically. So I've looked into different areas around this uh, and in different disciplines, mostly through having either worked on these projects myself um, or being a consultant to them, but latterly also trying to take a more empirical viewpoint in trying to understand uh, whether there are particular sizes of projects that work, whether there are particular shapes of project, uh, and and what are the increasingly the social factors as well as the technical factors that lead to to software teams being successful or not? So, um, so some other sorts of work that are related that I'm doing are around uh, things like software citation and credit. Mm -hmm. So understanding what are the incentives for people to to um, do well in teams. Uh, looking at something called FAIR for research software, where FAIR is making software findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that's the subject of another uh, paper that we submitted to Collegeville. And lastly, also working with the research software engineering uh, movements around mm -hmm. the world to try and get a better understanding of whether there's any challenges and barriers to um, equity, diversity, and inclusion in software teams, particularly those that are working on research software projects. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all a lot of stuff. I think it's all interrelated. Uh, and I certainly think that uh, one of the things that, that we need to be doing is being able to interrelate the, the kind of the, the team dynamic stuff with the technical side of uh, the practices and also the, uh, what I'll call the kind of social and, and almost like um, uh, political side of mm -hmm. teams and software as well. Mm -hmm. And so in your paper, you and your co-authors present a framework that, that does integrate technical and social and it helps identify different levels of research software. Can you explain what that means and how you recognized the need for a tool like that? Yeah, so um, a little bit about the genesis of, of this paper, it's sort of, uh, a bit of a half and half. So um, I was at a similar workshop to Collegeville, uh, maybe about two months ago, where I was in a session discussing with a number of other people, the challenges in trying to understand what were the right uh, approaches to testing quality assurance for, uh, for software based on uh, different kinds of needs and levels of maturity. And I'd mentioned that I had I'd previously been doing some thinking about creating a framework that would help us understand the sorts of levels of maturity of a software project and uh, by extension, the types of teams that they would have as part of them. Uh, and so uh, during the workshop, one of the things we tried to do was apply this proto framework to, uh, to the, the question of, of software testing and quality assurance and um, some of the other uh, aspects around understanding how to build better software. And we thought it was a, a good enough fit that we'd try and extend this and then submit to Collegeville. Uh, it, was, it was actually a really, a really great process because that other, other workshop was two days before the Collegeville uh, submission deadline. So it was, uh, it, was, it was a very rapid turnaround <laughs> for turning this into a, a full abstract. But I think um, where, where we saw the value in a framework like this, is that often we realize that it's not one size fits all for different types of approaches to uh, software quality, but also things like um, what, what sort of size of teams and the governance structure that you might need to have, uh, 
the different ways in which people might choose to uh, receive credit for their work and effectively the different dynamics at play for the, the, for the piece of software. So the, the framework itself has a set of levels which are defined by expected, uh, expected kind of um, axes. So how far along are you in terms of the number of users and the, the, sort of the how much those users are known to you or not uh, around how distributed your software is. So is it something that's very private to you or is it something which is uh, being shared as a product? Uh, the, the expected reuse, so um, very much about how often and for how long some, a piece of software will be reused, and the expected support uh, that might be given for that piece of software. And in part that links back to how much a software team is able to provide things that allow it to go along these different axes. Uh, if, you're, if you're a very small team, um, essentially when, when people are coming um, and starting off as a sort of personal software project, you're not expecting to provide support because you don't have any effort to do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the other end, if it's a critical piece of software um, infrastructure, your expectation is that there'll be a very high level of maintenance uh, and there's a high level of reuse as well. So much as uh, many other people have tried to, to create these sorts of frameworks, um, I know um, you've done some great work there in, in understanding uh, how that maps to some of the projects in NSF funded space uh, and There'd been, there's been other work that I've drawn upon from uh, analyzing startups in particular. What we see is this framework is a good way of, of perhaps seeing different clusters, different kind of distinct stages that uh, a piece of software goes through and also a, a software team that's producing that piece of software goes through. Yeah, it was very helpful for me to read and rethink through our own data looking at this framework actually. So it was a good read for me. Um, and you introduced the paper by recognizing that efforts to implement best practices or infrastructure, they have to be weighed against the cost or benefit to the group, like you were just saying. And then uh, you go on to explain, for instance, that different levels of scientific software might need different approaches to testing. So what does your framework and your general experience tell us about costs and benefits of the technical infrastructure for software development? So what we've tried to understand is what's a reasonable amount of, uh, of testing that you might want to do based on the, the level that your software is at and what that says about the amount of effort that's expected in the team mm -hmm. and the amount of uh, reuse that's expected of the software. So uh, as an example here, uh, it's, it's obviously best practice for you to, to have test frameworks set up and for you to have things like continuous integration. And that's what you see in a lot of the software engineering um, guidance, particularly the things that come out from industry. But in a, a research software context, a lot of the software that's produced might be one-off scripts that are used to do a single job to process data from one form into another. Um, and at that stage, setting up a test framework might be overkill. The, the cost of doing that out, outweighs the benefit. Um, at that stage, all we want to do is make sure that piece of software is not lost, and so it's recorded somewhere. Uh, and so what we try to understand is what are the requirements at each stage for testing in general, uh, and what are the types of approaches that might be best suited given that cost-benefit trade-off? Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, that's sort of an example of how we might apply this, this framework, this five levels of different types of software. The thing that we found really interesting uh, was that in doing this, we also identified the things that let you level up. So the points at which you, you needed to, to understand that the shift in cost to benefit was changing. Mm -hmm. um, and so for instance, there is, there is a point at which um, in the early stages, if you're going from something which is a personal project to something which is a piece of uh, software used more generally in your group, what we've labeled um, a research software, uh, there is a benefit to turning manual tests into automated tests simply because more people are going to be um, using and adapting the software. So the cost um, is outweighed by the benefit there. 
Um, later on, you can see other, other things which are not just on the technical side, but also on the, uh, the sort of legal and reputational side, where, for instance, as you go from being um, something that you're supporting to something that's a product uh, or something that's a critical piece of software, there may be very strong reputational um, consequences for, for instance, a data security leakage. So there, mm -hmm. the sorts of testing might also include compliance against uh, standards or other legal constraints. So I think as, as a framework, what, what's really been interesting is seeing that there are clear changes in the cost to benefit analysis ratio um, at e as you go between each stage. And um, it helps you think about what's required to go from one stage to the next. Great. And so one of those dimensions that you were talking about uh, in your framework is the distribution. And I thought it was interesting that you use distribution to refer not just to how broadly the software is shared, but also how close the relationship is between the developer and the user. And that made me wonder in what ways does like the sociality of a team or a discipline affect the kind of best practices that that software, that software team should use? I think that's a really, a really good question. Um, and it's one where uh, I think I personally, I'm still, I'm still learning a lot. Um, one of the things that we've seen when we've looked across different disciplines is that the way in which people choose to use and share software varies. Um, and I think this is something that's very different from, from industry. In industry, we might see this idea of, uh, of startups identifying an initial user base. So they, they always say with a startup, make the product that you would want to, to buy. Um, but then after that, it becomes very much uh, a, a, a case of like market analysis and market segmentation. With research, because it's more collaborative in nature and in the way that research software is built, it is often around diaspora where you've got people leaving um, a research group, establishing their own groups and then collaborating. Uh, we, see, we see a kind of different sort of sociology going on um, in the way that, that software is being built and software teams are being formed. And I think the key thing that we've tried to identify in this framework is that uh, there is a distinction between people that you know and you collaborate with and their expectations on your software and people who are using it who you've never met um, and uh, something that I was very aware of when I was working on, on some quite large data um, base uh, style projects is when people start using your software in ways you did not envisage them doing it. Because at that point, if you're, if you're trying to support them, uh, you're starting to get divergence of roadmaps. What you want to do with the software and what your close collaborator um, user base may want to do with software may be very different from how the broader community are trying to use your software. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a kind of key stage that a lot of um, research software goes through. And in terms of software teams, it's also the stage where traditionally you would bring on board um, the equivalent of a product manager, because all of a sudden it's not your project, it is a product. Talking on mute, that's a very good point and a, a nice threshold to be thinking about. Um, and so now I'm kind of spitballing, uh, but in your paper, you referenced a project that I was working on, so I'm going to call it fair game. Uh, and in that work, we've seen that sometimes people sustain the software team or the organization, but not necessarily the software itself. And it struck me when reading your paper that that might mean that your reuse dimension could also refer to the degree that the best practices are expected to be reused as in a package might become unsupported, but the team plans to re-implement those practices for their next endeavor. And so I was wondering what ways do you see for your framework to be extended either in that way or other ways, uh, how else might it be extended? Yeah. Um, I think some of that is actually, is captured in the current framework. I think it's a really good point you make uh, that in, in a lot of uh, academic software projects, it's not so much just about a specific product, it's about the knowledge that's, uh, that's built up within the, the group. And I think that's also true in industry as well. Um, there's, there's always a lot of pivoting, there's always a lot of um, 
of it being about the expertise and knowledge that's been based up, the intellectual property effectively, rather than the products itself. Uh, and I think one of the big, the big sort of transitions as you go from the first three levels, which are all kind of much more what we understand and, and happens an awful lot in the research space to the kind of product and critical levels is that under expected reuse, there's an explicit mention there of um, basically reuses until the product is superseded. And there, I think one of the, the key things is um, understanding as a, as a software team, uh, what the balance is between continuing support for the, the current version of the product and developing the next, um, the next version within the same group or team. And I think, I think there needs to be an explicit recognition of this because whilst we do have some very long lived software, every piece of software has a lifetime. Um, and uh, particularly from a software sustainability perspective, one of the challenges I think for funders of software is that you can't necessarily uh, both fund new software all the time and also fund maintenance of software that's in use. So there has to be some of this sunsetting and, and um, superseding of software. Um, but yeah, um, I, I, think, I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. And mm -hmm. there's, uh, it would be really good to get some more use cases, uh, understanding what happens at that kind of level. Because I think uh, to, to use a, an analogy from, from startups, um, there's a point normally where the, where the founder steps back and becomes the CTO or sells out and, and kind of the product becomes bought up to be part of a portfolio of a much larger company. I don't think that happens as often as it should do in um, academic software. I think the PI often maintains that, that CEO role uh, and perhaps we never quite move into those stages where it's treated as a, as a product rather than as a um, more of a personal accomplishment. But mm -hmm. then again, you know, we've had companies like Apple uh, with, with Steve Jobs doing exactly that. So but perhaps there is no difference. It's just, just how much money you can make off it. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so we only have a few minutes left, but before we finish up, I wanted to ask if you have any further ideas you'd like to share about how to improve software teams work. Um, so the big thing that we'd really love to do is, is uh, doing something that's been similar to, to some of the work that I've drawn upon. So both your own work um, and the work um, by Max Marmer on the Startup Genome Report, which is to, to kind of, we've, we've used some evidence from projects that we've worked on to identify these levels and these frameworks. So now we've got to do the, the empirical part. We want to go back and uh, take a large enough groupings of projects and see whether or not they are falling into these different categories and whether we can see clearly uh, that the way that we expect, for instance, testing or the other example um, that we give in the, in the paper is around the infrastructure that's being used, whether those are, are being seen um, as, as clustering on those different um, levels in, of the framework. And then understanding whether there are any things that we can do to nudge people to produce better software and to run more efficient software teams by changing where a particular thing, a piece of infrastructure or a testing approach is used and, and shifting it up or down a level. So it's back to what you mentioned about cost benefit analysis. Um, it, we, we'd like to see whether what we think is the right approach um, based on these levels works um, and if it doesn't, whether we should be encouraging practice to shift again, based on this framework, which gives us a better understanding of, of identifying what stage you are as a project so that you can, you can learn from the appropriate guidance rather than generic guidance, which is mostly focused on uh, perhaps projects that are much further along a particular maturity path than yours is. That's Great, thank you. This has been an excellent discussion. Thanks for sharing your work and your ideas. Um, and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye.